This is a show for grown-ups. And they say bad words. And they say bad words. Say final warning. Final warning. <laughs> Welcome to the Pod of Blunders. I am your host, Mike Magnuski. I'm glad bad things happen to you. <laughs> the worst, really. And not that bad thing. Well, that Other was pretty bad. bad. Things. Lesser bad things, like you stub your toe or something. Just... Up to and including cutting your tendon in your foot. Yeah, well, why don't you do like a real intro without somebody talking over you? I wouldn't know what to do. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Pod of Blunders. I am your host, Nate Magnuski, and with me as always... Is this real douche next to me, Richard Sullivan? Hi, guys. And he's really real next to me. We're sharing a microphone. It's as intimate as it sounds. And with us as last time is CJ Mickey. Hey, everyone. It's me. I assume we said hello. I can't hear him. I have my headphones off. <laughs> <laughs> also, Matt's still here, despite our trying to hide this from him. I, I've been in this meeting for oh, uh, two weeks now. <laughs> I haven't left. <laughs> Thank you for keeping that link alive, bud. <laughs> Matt, what are we doing today? You're so fucking smart. Today, we're talking, what is this, the in-between, It's you, you, you're calling it? We're, we're doing the uh, afterthoughts on Questlandia. See? I studied my shit. And also, it was only a week ago. We talked a little bit. Richard has never heard it, because it was after he got off mic last time. But we talked a little bit about how we like the game at the end of this episode. Richard was too busy puking and poofing. Guys, I'm, I'm sorry. The, la <laughs> the last episode, you, when you listen, you'll probably notice, I got like horrible like diarrhea and puking episodes like 20 minutes into the thing so every time i'm not talking i'm in the other room shitting so keep that in mind as you listen to the show it wouldn't be so bad if you just turned your mic and camera off <laughs> i brought wait well, yeah, cuz i brought the laptop into the bathroom so everyone could see the people are going to want to know i don't want to miss nothing well then you didn't want to be like he's not really pooping like i got the receipts right here and it's good foley work too. I appreciate that. Yeah. So if ever like fighting a bog monster or like I don't know, like doing a double dare scene where we're going down that big goopy slide, we get all the sound quality right there. See? The mark of a professional. <laughs> I appreciate your sacrifice. Yeah, we're talking about Questlandia today. We're talking about our actual play and the game itself. First and foremost, CJ, what did you think about the game? Uh I, I thought it was good. It it was really hard for me though. Very hard. Why is that, man? Uh, you have to be very creative. It's like very, very creatively demanding because sometimes you get put on the spot and that's just hard for some people. Not for you, man. You're a pro. Oh, I don't know. You never disappoint. Don't don't be modest. Because we've done a couple of narrative heavy games with CJ. We yeah, did. he we, always fucking delivers. That's why I keep inviting him back for these ones. Right. I don't give him the easy stuff. Softballs are for like, you know, Matt or something. No, when it comes time to, to, <laughs> to figure out who's going to be on the show and we get the, the list... And I know when I'm going to need a, a, you know, what do you call it? A clutch hitter? A clutch? Pinch hitter? Pinch hitter. That's the one. Yeah. When I need one of them, CJ. Well, the clutch hitter also works for that. Yeah, because yeah. he's, he's good he's in, in a, in in a, a pinch. And, oh! and I am pretty good. <laughs> it's all adding up. There has to be a lot of trust between the people that you play with. Because when you create a world like this, everyone has their own version of that world in their mind. So you have to be able to trust the people that you're with to have similar enough versions of that world to make something kind of cohesive. For me, like, I, I'm like, I love being in control of things. Like, I, I like DMing and when I DM, I, I could play every NPC because I have that world in my mind and everyone else is just reacting to me and I have that control. But like, in this game, you kind of, release that control to everyone else and it's very shared i don't think that's a bad thing though i think for people who who really like that and who like creating these worlds i think that's good and and i like the game too and i i think it had like a lot of good things going for it it's very creative uh creatively demanding too i think it's interesting that there were certain like built-in rules well it is a shared narrative it is a shared building experience like to name someone like you're the czar of beetle piss now you know like it's like playground rules like oh everyone makes up whatever they want but there's like a hard line to it like okay no but whatever richard says about that thing goes mm -hmm. 
delineations are important in games like this. Yeah, I, I think for a game, we played a similar game to this. What what was it? It was with the Titan. Oh, Facing the Titan. Yeah, Facing the Titan is also very similar. I think that structure benefits it. So it gives them that control of that little area. And it also just, I think, makes it a bit more well-rounded for different kinds of settings and everything. I always find it interesting when these like really freeform narrative heavy games go so heavy on the the scripting of it the structure of it like with with titan you know it's very much like this in this act you do x y and z these are the tables you roll on these are the specific notes you have to hit in this game we had much of the same you know there were certain things you had to do in each scene and like certain things you covered certain people played this part there were certain tables you had to roll on it was very specific and exacting and that fostered the crazy openness of it it was like freedom with constraint Matt, what do you think? I also agree that it was a little more creative, de creatively demanding than I expected it to be, but it was a lot of fun. You know, I thought that the whole building the world together sort of helped build some trust between, like I've never gamed before with CJ, uh, and I've only gamed with the two of you once in the past. And I think that it helped gain some trust and show what folks were comfortable with and like where things were going to go. Um, and it sort of like set a, I don't know, like a groundwork for the game to go a little more smoothly. I can't imagine playing this with a whole group of people that I don't know, because I think that there does need to be some level of trust there that is before you're building it with folks. There's a lot of other people's stories that are going to, to sort of rely on on you and what you come to the table with and add to the to the narrative. But I did really like that it it you know once someone was in control of something like beetle piss or knockoff guns or whatever that like they sort of had the the end all be all of it unless it got hardcore vetoed because that's how the war is built and you sort of have a concrete way of doing that. Is that pressure? Is there a pressure there to like uphold the shared narrative in terms of like you want to introduce your own world and ideas to things. You want to have your own influence on it. But you want to make sure that it's still fitting within what everyone else is having fun with. Like I feel like if you don't have the, so the social skills to be able to read the room at all, you could take things in like disastrous directions and really derail a game very easily. Yeah, I, I was feeling a pressure. I remember when we were creating it, uh, I was like, okay, Rulo Keat knows the secret to how Vex lost his hand. And then I didn't even know that, but I'm like, crap, now I have to think of something really good. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that narrative point or plot point kind of shifted throughout our game too. Because at the beginning we were like, oh, you know, oh wait, no, it wasn't Vex's hand, it was Locust's hand. Yeah. Sorry. At first we were like, oh, Vex Gerson uh, was the one who did it. And then I came up with the idea that we hired a hitman. And then Locust in the end revealed that uh, what was it? You shot off your own hand or something? I like picked a scab and it got bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to just, like deny that by saying it shot off. Yeah, very a very dramatic way to lose your hand. <laughs> um, but I, I think that kind of like overriding the the truth again. You you really have to be playing with, or it really helps if you're playing with people who you really trust. But you did all right playing with us though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it was a good time though. It was. You mentioned something about only playing this with people that you trust. And the first time I played this game in short was at PAX East maybe four years ago. Uh, the designer, Hannah, was the person that ran it for us. And it was me, past guest Eric Crumrine, and some random woman that was there at PAX. And it was weird. Like, it was kind of nice to have. I had no idea what she was all about. I knew she was a furry because of the way she was. And I thought like, oh, maybe she's gonna bring some of that energy into it. Like, what is she gonna bring to the table? And I think everybody was so cautious in like not saying anything outlandish to make sure no one thought they were out of their nuts or, you know, that there was some kind of shared narrative that was bland almost at the end of it. People were just too caught, too careful and too cautious. I'd rather say something stupid and apologize for it later. Yes, than, I know. Than, <laughs> but than, than, than feeling like I'm holding back. Yeah. Like it, you're supposed to be creative, you know, like that's art, man. Right. I think if you're bold enough and conf confident enough to do it, sure. Yeah. But not everyone is. I wonder, if, like, if you had a game of four Wallflower type players who were just very cautious and, like, you know, reserved, I think this game would just tank. Yeah. I, I think a lot of tabletop role playing games have that That's problem, true. too. Yeah. I And I think that problem might be exacerbated in this kind of game. It, it does help if you trust the people that you're with and you're comfortable because 
maybe that releases your inhibitions a little bit. Or I don't know, maybe if you get drunk or high or something and play this, I think you'd have a really good time too. I also think like if you go in to it, not wanting anything in particular, but just to get the most out of the game and just to interact with it. And it doesn't matter if your character dies or does well or succeeds or fails or anything like that. I think if you go into it thinking like, I just want something cool to happen, I think that would also help you play this. It just gets you into a better mindset, I think. that That's what I was trying to do with Rulo Keat too. Like, I, I didn't care if he failed or if he succeeded. I just wanted something interesting to happen. And I think it's freeing in a way that it's a one-shot. Like, it's not meant for campaign play. So you can focus it, like, oh, I want to play with this character for the next four months of my life. No, man, you get eight hours maybe, and that's it. Oh, man, I got ADHD like crazy. I can't remember what I did the week before. It was bad <laughs> enough. This is one of the few games where we've done a two-parter where we've recorded it separately. I couldn't remember half the stuff. Like, I don't, I don't want to feel like I'm locked into something. I like the freedom of create something and then destroy it and then never pick it up again. And one of the biggest complaints about Questlandia is that you spend so much time building this world, this shared experience, and you only get to play in that sandbox for a little bit. And so Questlandia 2 that's coming out is designed for campaign play. I won't be playing that. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. I love Questlandia 1. Like, it's a good game, and it does what it sets out to do very, very well. And I'm sure Questlandia 2 will be fine. You know, I have games that do that. I don't have many games that do this. I mean, I don't have many games that do this either, I no, guess. You're, so. you're, you're best friends with Evan. Evan Rowland, right? Co-designer. I mean, I yeah, best friends having met a couple of times, absolutely. The same way I'm best friends with, with, with all of you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I never talked about this game with him, unfortunately, so I did not, uh, I, I don't have insight there but I, it's not like i felt like i had maybe something else to say but i mean i think that having the i going off the questlandia 2 thing for for a second because i do like having sort of longer campaigns i love my one shots um a lot more now but i think all of us at some point maybe barring richard uh just because of play style uh, i think all of us at one point were like man i really like this world like it would be really fun to like continue this if we wanted to have that option but honestly, had we continued even into a third episode, uh, given how the cards and stuff played out, uh, I think that we would have just had a crater in the ground to, <laughs> to, to like, role play in. It's like some stories, like I'm seeing it like with all the Disney Plus shit now. Some things are better suited for a two hour movie and not everything has to be an eight hour series. Our story worked better as a two hour Western as opposed to three seasons where it starts off pretty good and then you know, turns into Game of Thrones by the end. Yeah. So that brings me to a good point. Why Westerns? Like we've done a lot of fantasy stuff and sci-fi was just something new. Cause you were really the one that, that well, how do we guided us that way? I, I vaguely, but how do we even get to the, get to that? I, I think we brought up like what the setting is going to be. And then I think Richard, you just said like, yeah, let's just do a Western. And then all of us were like, yeah, sure. Let's do oh, that. Yeah. And <laughs> I don't think anyone even <laughs> offered like a different, setting was, <laughs> i think uh, we were like, just like western okay what well, because i think we talked about like trains or steam yeah we drew a card and it directed us or we rolled a die or something like that and it directed us towards like our our civilization was focused on industry and then i think it was like oh what kind of industry is is like we're robber barons or it's like yeah oh, yeah wrestling, like it like pony express i think yeah. that was mm. what started yeah. it and then it just you, you were like westerns and we were like oh fuck it yeah i, I like <laughs> westerns i you know for a guy that the co-hosts you know, a role-playing podcast. I don't dig on a lot of fantasy, sword and sandals. Uh, you know, I like westerns. I like you know action horror. So anytime I get to play something I like, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. And I, I think that the idea of a small like frontier town is just easier than this massive mega city. So yeah. let me blow your mind a little bit about that, right? Westerns are just like Tolkien fantasy with all the English scrubbed off of them and put in a desert instead of a forest. Because you have your, your posses traveling around trying to right wrongs, uh, going to these little like shithole towns here and there. There might be a big city far away that you can travel to, but really it's like it might makes right and there's weird shit in the wilderness, so try to survive it. It's the exact same as traditional fantasy, well, just with cool hats. There's only yeah, seven I... stories, you know, in the world, so like, right. you know, I'm not arguing that. Wow. <laughs> wow. Sounds yeah. like pretty defensive. Westerns are just fantasy with guns. And I think it's a bit more relatable too, because 
we have guns nowadays. So like it gives you all this range for a character that you create. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. It's so I mean, you, you could be some like colonel who rides a horse with a saber, a cavalryman or something. And in a Western, that's still not unusual, right? Yeah. It's, you can have swords and guns together. So Westerns are great. I love Westerns. Well, yeah. What's your favorite Western? See, here's so the much. thing, though. I love the concept of Westerns, <laughs> and I don't think I've ever seen a Western movie. So what the fuck do you mean you love Westerns? I, I just like the setting. I love it. He's not in love with you. He's in love with the idea of you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, if I were to DM a campaign, like, I'd love to DM a Western campaign. Well, it's awesome. Westlandia 2 comes out. Yeah, let's do a Portlandia too. Yeah, he already says he's a control freak who loves the idea of westerns. Yes, <laughs> I can't see anything to go wrong with this. <laughs> what about you? What about you, Mel? Western, pick one. Uh, go. Uh, I, I just got into westerns like over the last couple of years, so I'm not super well versed. Um, Tombstone, for sure. Yeah. Um, and I think it counts as a western, and I'm, I feel like I'm gonna screw up the name, but I think it was. Uh, is it? Desperado? Is that the one with Antonio Banderas? Yeah, that's not a Western. Okay. I don't know. It takes place in the West. The West. It's got guns. Yeah. I mean... I mean, it's it's pretty much a Western, but with a different flair on it, I think. It's a modern... But, we uh, it's as much of a Western as Dust Till Dawn is. It's as much of a Western as The Lord of the Rings is, Richard. Come on. Right. Oh, fine. Everything's a Western. <laughs> <laughs> but I would go with... Love, actually. Well, actually... <laughs> <laughs> Big Trouble in Little China was originally written as a Western, but it was too much money... So they said, well, I'll make him a truck driver instead. That makes a lot of sense. Huh. That's all. <laughs> That's my, this has been your John Carpenter fact of the week. <laughs> he was also supposed to do a Western with, with Elvis and John Wayne, and it never happened. That's a shame. That's a damn shame. Two well-known Hollywood pedophiles in the same Western. Oh, who did, who did John Wayne diddle? I know Elvis. Probably something. Now you're just saying stuff. What's he going to do, haunt me? <laughs> Fuck you, John Wayne. Why don't you go ahead and try to punch an Indian during the Oscars again? Fuck uh. you. Anyway, <laughs> but I well, see. Here's the thing: our artist. I grew up, you know, martyred by love for westerns. Is my mother like idolized John Wayne? So I grew up watching Rio Bravo, Rio Grande, you know, The Quiet Man. Like oh, Quiet Man's good. Yeah, we were a John Wayne household. And it wasn't the movie so much that she loved; it was the identity politics of it, which I think is really important to to note. Wow. Rest in peace, Ma. Wait, no. I revised my answer. I, I do have a favorite Western. <laughs> well, I, I know I've seen at least one Western, and okay. that's Wild Wild West. You Solid that? choice. Okay. <laughs> All right. You remember that? <laughs> With the giant metal spider? <laughs> Selma Hayek's butt. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you remember Selma Hayek's butt. Of all the things in that movie, I kind of forgot she was in it. I remember them. The heat, uh, oh, my God. What's his name? The guy. Will Smith. The other one. Yeah. Will Smith. Artemis that's that's Clyde all I remember. Frog. Artemis Clyde Frog. No. Oh my god, I love him. A fish called Wanda, in and out. Uh, Kevin Klein. Kevin Klein. Kevin Klein picking up a dead guy's head. And like, remember that? He's like magnifying his eyeball. Yeah, he's turning so he... a light to see his last thing he saw. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's just a dumb, awesome movie. Thanks, CJ. Yeah, and Cisco was in the music video. Was that he? was cool. Oh my god, that's right. He's the one that sang it. He's like, enough of this thong song nonsense. It's time for the Wild Wild West. Nate, what, how about you? Westerns. I know one in particular you're going to mention. Yeah. Because it's your dad's favorite movie of all time. The Unforgiven. Yeah. You can't beat The Unforgiven for modern-ish Western. His dad, no matter what, it's... It can be on TV 40 times in a row where we find him, like, desiccated in the couch <laughs> with Unforgiven floating in the background of you. Like, his entire, like, movie collection is a VHS copy of <laughs> yeah. The Stooges. I was going to say Unforgiven. <laughs> but a VHS copy of The Unforgiven. Mm -hmm. Like a DVD of The Unforgiven. Yep. If he was cool and like a hipster, he'd have a laser disc of The Unforgiven, but he doesn't. Was that around for laser disc? Would he have to like special order that? Of course that? it was around for laser disc. Laser disc had its day from like the 80s all the way up until like 2000. Really? Oh, yeah. I didn't know it was that lengthy. Oh, it was a superior format, but that's another show. I don't think it can be. <laughs> Look how mad Matt looks right now. <laughs> Matt, what I have, I have no investment. I have I have literally no no investment in the laser disc argument. I'm sorry. <laughs> I went from DVD to Blu-ray, and that's that's my uh, my gateway. I mean, I I watch a lot of Western movies, and I think it's probably because of my dad. You know, yeah. Like the Sisters Brothers is a newer one. Haven't seen it yet, but I'm dying to. Awesome, it's really fucking good. Yeah, it's a new True Grit. New True Grit is. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think we mentioned because Rulo Keat is supposed to be uh, Bruce like, Cogburn, like in, but the, yeah, but Jeff yeah, Bridges. Yeah, Jeff Bridges yeah. and True Grit. I've seen that one. I didn't like that movie as much as Wild Wild West. Well, I mean, apples and like <laughs> tree frogs. No, <laughs> two totally different things. I'm tired of the comparison of apples and oranges. But this is an apt comparison for that because they're, they're both Western Westerns. movies. They're both Westerns. And it's not like he's like my favorite Western is a ham sandwich, and you're like, yes, yeah, good. What are you looking up? What's that Christian Bale Western? I can't remember the name. Oh, of. 310 to Yuma. No. Yes. No. Uh, Hostiles. Hostiles. That one though. You're thinking of Russell Crowe. Was he the one in 310 to Yuma? Yeah. Hey, but the quick and the dead though. 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 This whole podcast is just gonna be. A, hey, remember that movie? Yeah, it was pretty yeah. good. But what makes a good Western? What are the key elements that you need to have in a Western movie or a Western piece of media that makes you feel like, all right, hmm. like, do you need cowboys? Could you have like a rancher Western and just have that and narrate it out to be bothered? Isn't a rancher a cowboy? No! I think you need cowboys. I think you well, need Western cowboys, movie. guns, and action. Sand? Sheriffs. Sand, yeah. Guns. Maces. Duels. Horses. Yeah, I kind of want to have a shootout somewhere in there. I want goofy ones. I want like some guy falling out of the second floor of a saloon. <laughs> is Cowboy Bebop a western? You ever it has Cowboy, cowboy in it. So it has Cowboy. I don't think it's a western. Is Kid Rock a Cowboy western? <laughs> is this <Mason's> an <laughs> instrument? What are we doing? <laughs> oh, what makes a good western? I don't know. I think it needs to be like a sense of like justice, and everything has to be horrible. Everyone has to be dirty, and missing teeth. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that's my favorite part of Westerns is when everyone's <laughs> dirty and has missing teeth. Yeah, but... Well, dental hygiene. I didn't say it was your favorite part. I said, but, what do you need? But that's the fuck that, like, you talk about True Grit. Like, you look at the John Wayne True Grit, and everyone's way too pretty. You know? Nobody's dirty. The costumes are all pristine. Hateful well, Eight. Oh, Hateful Eight, though. Western. Django, though. Oh, Django. Oh, Who's Django. Django? <laughs> Can any story be a good story and then it just happens to be in the west or is there something about a western like we talked about like oh it could be a western in space or firefly is a western in space well i i think you sort of hit it on the head with the theme though is that like most of the the westerns that folks remember are there's some either justice in some way shape or form either people are railing against like an unfair form of justice and making their own or they're trying to uphold justice against those people and firefly for instance does you know you have a bunch of essentially outlaws for for lack of a better term sort of doing the same thing as you would see in something like insert a western here where it's people going against the law so i mean i think so at the very least i don't think you necessarily have to have it out in the desert necessarily or out in the in the wild wild west i think it, you can retrofit it into another setting for sure you ever see Bone Tomahawk? I literally just looked up the title so I could bring it up. <laughs> I, I was going to bring that up. I was going to bring it up. Right, because it's, it's you take two genres. <laughs> Wait, but... we've all seen uh, Bone Tomahawk? No, I, I've never seen Bone Tomahawk, oh. but I know everything about Bone Tomahawk. It's so good. And I, want, and I want to see it, but I just haven't sat down and done it. Experience, for sure. We have a movie night and we're going to watch yeah, Bone Tomahawk. What I love is when you mash two genres, like space horror, like right. Alien is a haunted house movie in space. Bo Domahawk, cannibal movie yeah, in the old west. Holocaust, but old western. Wait, wait, wait! Are you spoiling it though? What, that there's cannibals in it? Yeah, I mean they're pretty forthright about that. You just said that. you knew everything about it, CJ. <laughs> well, I know it. I, okay. Well, are you I don't spoiling the how, main plot? I don't know how Richard. they. Re- <laughs> I don't know how they release all the details in the movie. I just know everything about the movie. You're right. It's free range, naturally sourced bone tomahawks. <laughs> I know everything about it, except for everything there is to know about it. You know, who's All right, in maybe it? I don't know much about it, but I do want to see it, and I know, I know the ending, and I've seen the ending. Then why are you getting mad about our spoilers? <laughs> I don't because I'm not spoiling it. I'm not spoiling it. You know the ending. <laughs> yeah, but what about the people dude? listening? They don't know. <laughs> I think they, they show the cannibals in like the first like two minutes of the movie. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because uh, what's his name? Uh, cannibal Mr. Man? No, uh, Sid Haig and um, Can David Idol. Arquette. <laughs> They're in the beginning with it. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Well, I'm sorry to spoil that for you, bud, but there's totally cannibals. And Kurt uh, Russell has a cool mustache. The coolest mustache. But the same mustache he had in Hateful Eight. It's like he grew the mustache and was like, I'm just going to do this a slew of westerns and then I can shave it. If Henry Cavill had half the fucking courage of, and conviction that that dude had, we'd have so many more mustache movies with him. 
Henry Cavill's mustache, though. It's a good mustache. It's a great mustache. I almost wish they kept it in Justice League. Yeah. But give me a mustachioed Superman. Right. And be like, oh, well, then I'd be like, that's an evil Superman because <laughs> he's got a mustache. And it would have worked out mostly. It's so do you out. think mustaches are indicative of evil? Go. Yeah, and, and most popular media, they get like a little spot goatee, that kind of thing, you know? Hmm. Snidely whiplash with a mm, twisting his mustache. I imagine my character had a mustache. Well, yeah, you were evil. Yeah. You were a real piece of shit. Well, who's a famous good guy with a mustache? Not Chuck Norris. Because anybody can stop a bad guy with a mustache. It's a good guy with a mustache. There must have been like, a James Bond <laughs> person, right? James Bond never Sorry had a mustache. It. Really? They didn't? Why would James Bond oh. have a mustache? You're thinking Czar does. <laughs> There's been mustache. like 20 James Bonds. And all sans mustache. You can't oh, even really? have a mustache in the Secret Service. Oh, yeah, I guess they all. Or MI6 or whatever. MI8? How many MIs are there? He's an MI6. Okay. Are you sure? I'm not a huge James Bond guy. No, me either. Damn it. None of them have mustaches. No. <laughs> Lando Calrissian. <laughs> he had a mustache. Yeah, but he yeah, was Lando. complicated. What about uh, Errol Flynn? What about Errol Flynn? He had a mustache. He was a good guy, right? Robin Hood had a mustache. All right. See? Matt. Is Tom Selleck. <laughs> Tom Selleck. Magnum P.I. Wyatt yeah. Earp. Wyatt Earp. This one has some questionable... This is a list of great men with mustaches. <laughs> great men with mustaches. Like, some of them are good. Like, yeah, MLK, sure. yeah. Albert Einstein, no argument. Great. Then it's like Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh... Oh, popular. He's a yeah, philosopher. I guess that's great. But I guess Einstein and Earp are... Ron Burgundy. Anchorman. You ever see that? Oh, yeah. But don't spoil it. He's an anchorman in it. <laughs> But anyway, we're, we're talking about actors with mustaches, without mustaches. We were talking about something the other day on on this. What actor plays your character? Does anybody do that? Like, I know for me, like when I read a book, I cast it in my mind movie of who I want playing it. When you guys create a character or play a game or, or anything, do you, do you guys do the same? And do you find it helpful? Yeah. So if I'm DMing, well, I don't know if I ever really do this myself, but I know a really helpful technique for DMs is to cast your NPCs as actors because then you can, instead of writing down every single little detail about your character that you're going to be an NPC as, you can just like think of, you know, a famous character like uh, David Bowie from Labyrinth or something as your crazy villain. So like that, that's like a clear character or a clear actor for your character and you know how they're going to play out. Yeah, I think it is very helpful. Like, I think Rulo Key was Jeff Bridges. I know that he was a badass, so it just makes sense. How about you, Matt? Uh, actually, pretty regularly as far as, like, PCs are concerned. Uh, I did do it when I DM before for, for NPCs, but um, the, the group that I play with regularly, we tend to, I, I don't know when we got into the habit of doing it, but we tend to find some actor or actress sort of fits the mannerisms and the look that we're going for with our character and we'll sort of present it at some point early on in the campaign or the game to be like hey this is you know i see them being played by this person and so i thought it was kind of cool that we did it for this time because it's something that i've been kind of used to doing and yeah i think it definitely helps paint a paint a picture for you it gives a very quick like reference for your mind to jump to and i forgot who were you uh this was uh near dark era that's right bill paxton unrelated who, then who were you when you played Vapor? Uh, that's played a really Max? solid question. I was I think I was too nervous playing with a new group to have, to have cast him, but I'm I'm sure that I probably have it somewhere written down that I I probably did it after the fact. Well, it's tough because we were playing like teens. I don't know a ton of teen actors. Good. Yeah, it's probably for the best. <laughs> otherwise, I'd be on the list. How about well, you? Like man? Michael J. Fox when he was a teen. <laughs> well, yeah, but, safe. Well, but you can do that because. He said, I love what he's well, actually with both of you guys said. It was like, oh, this era, because it, it's fantasy. So mm. you can be living actors that you're not constrained by if somebody's dead or, it's true. you know, canceled or whatever. Like they can be in your movie. It doesn't matter. It's not real. And that's the fun of fiction if you think about it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Ron Swanson had a good mustache. <laughs> Great mustache. <laughs> Excellent Zappa. mustache. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. another one. You know, it's funny. Freddie Mercury? Yeah, Good he looked, actually looked weird without one. Yeah, because it was too big. Well, you know, you pulled up on your list, and and because I, I can see your computer from where I'm sitting. It's true. Trebek, great mustache, but mm. what fucks me up is there's a whole generation of kids that don't know Trebek is having a mustache. Weird thought. 
Man at Arms. Man which, at Arms. Which is essentially just Tom Selleck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Selleck, best mustache ever, we can agree? No. Sam Elliott. Mm, no. Selleck. Sam Elliott, you're wrong. You guys, back me up on this. I, just, I feel like we need a whole, a whole debate cast about this, honestly, for, for the two of you to duke it out. We got time to kill. <laughs> Are on your questions? I've been oh, vamping no, about no mustaches. <laughs> this is mustache talk now. Welcome to the mustache cast. Mustached, must mustache you a questionnaire. No. Pod stash. Pod stash. Pod of stashes. <laughs> Radio free mustache. I'm just saying I could shave everything right here. Down. I've tried it a few times. I always grow one at somebody's wedding. So when they take all the pictures, like, who's that creep in the mustache? I can ruin the whole wedding party. I did it for Ryan's. You did, yeah, and you did. It looked awful. <laughs> you were on the list at the end of that night. <laughs> you kept stealing all the letters off the bathrooms. I still I still have one of them, but it's in pieces. But I don't remember for the men's or the women's, because the thing about M's and W's, it's the same either way. <laughs> no, we past the statute of limitation for petty theft, right? It's only like five years. I mean, insurance, man. Nobody really gets hurt. They're not coming at me for a W or an M. Hey, Ryan paid good enough for that haul. Like, yeah. get his money's worth. Yeah, they owe us a W or an M. So I remember listening to a podcast recently. It was a Mike Shea, the Lazy DM podcast. And he was talking about, you know, a really quick and efficient way to get your NPC started. It was just like, take someone from popular media. Like, oh, this is, you know, Spock. He's the character music for this elf type character here. And he was debating, like, do you tell your players hey, this is based off of this character, so they can get into it right away. Or do you, like, keep that close to the vest to not, like, take them out of the narrative? I don't think you tell them, because maybe in their head it would be somebody else's. Like, I had everybody else cast way different than they what they were cast. So you think, like, just providing the cultural touchstone isn't worth it? I think it's good to have in here, pointing to my heart, but you don't give it to them. That's interesting. Cause like, as... he, he could say he's Jeff Bridges all day. I thought he was Nick Nolte. I thought Matt was Ben Foster, uh, and I thought you, I don't know who I thought you were. A young Hugo Weaving. No, no, <laughs> you weren't Hugo Weaving. You, Because you had to be, like, real shitty. So I was trying to think of, like, somebody I could envision as, like, a real shitbag. Matt Bartlett. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, it was perfect. Who, who's that? No. What? Never heard that name before. <laughs> Yeah, no one's ever called out your name. Oh! <laughs> What's Matt catching all these trees today? Well, it was really nice gaming with you. I got a, I got a thing to do. Matt, you know, you're like like that little girl in kindergarten. Like, like of course, we. Love, I'm going to say a nice thing. What? Like, we, we like you, so that's like why we could kick you and put gum in your hair. It's because we like you. It's a term of endearment. and you from your child's kindergarten class? Yeah, because these kids, I really liked them, so I started kicking them all. <laughs> That's a great drawing. She goes, like, fuck you. you. Ow. <laughs> and how many fingers does Santa Claus have? <laughs> exactly. It's trash. Get it out of here. <laughs> what do you guys think about the casting bit, though? Like, like, we shut the fuck up, Richard. Let's call it segue. <laughs> Embrace it. So we all agree the casting is fun and cool thing to do. And I was saying, like, telling your players about the NPCs your characters are based on as a DM. Richard, you're all for casting. But you're against someone telling them about NPC they're based on, based because it's going to throw off. Right, because <laughs> when I watch a movie, you know, I know Christopher Reeve isn't really Superman. But what? wait, what? in that moment, I want to believe that he is. I don't want to go, oh, that's the guy. He had the divorce with this one, and he got caught with his dick at the, you know, like because because that's you know, the tabloid era that we know. Like Errol Flynn, we didn't know shit about until years later, mm -hmm. right? But actors today, we know everything there is, so it kind of. It murks it. Know what I mean? No, I think you muddied the point more. I'm not sure. where. What's the difference between telling someone, like, okay, my character's based off of Hugo Weaving in terms of what he looks like? Is it just, like, you're giving too much information on how that person acts? Is that what it is? Is that what you're... I just hate it when, it, when an actor outweighs the character. Oh, okay. I guess is what I'm saying. So, like, saying, oh, this, this elf is based off of Spock versus, like, oh, he looks like Leonard Nimoy. Yes. There's different things entirely. Cause right. One is, like... Everything about that, like the essence of the characters in this. Right. Okay. I think it, you know, you said lazy DM, yeah. but yeah, it's lazy to go, oh yeah, and he's like uh, Batman, except he's got a purple cape. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I kind of see where you're coming from with that. I feel like as like a DM doing it is a little different, like coming right out and being like, oh, this person you're interacting with is is this person. But like as the PCs, I guess I, I feel a little more lenience about it just because they're trying to establish something. But I mean, I get, I do get your point of like, 
you know, if somebody at the moment is like, oh, hey, Chris Pratt, for instance, like there's mixed feelings amongst people with, with him. And there, there might be like, that might outweigh the actual image that they're trying to put forward of their, of their character. So yeah, no, I, I see your point. Also, if you tell your players what the character's based off of, that might just give away things that you don't want to give away. Like maybe this guy is the big bad evil guy. And if you say, oh, you know, this guy, he just imagine Darth Vader. That's that's who he is. But he's like, you know, the court jester or something. You're going <laughs> to you're going you're gonna to know something's up with that. Wait a minute. I think it, it really depends on a case by case basis. Like sometimes um, if you're a DM, you, you don't want to put too much thought into it. So you just say, OK, this character is this person. And then that just gets the point across to the players. But other times you you want the players to react based off of what you're doing and what you're doing is based off the character. So you want that obfuscation in terms of like revealing who the character is based off of all the time. I like the idea of basing a character off of something in popular media just for efficiency's sake. But yeah, telling them is just gonna... Right. It sucks. Like, <laughs> the, the whole reason I even said, oh shit, Gene Hackman was, I'm building this character. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. I've gone back in my subconscious and blended like two Gene Hackman westerns and that's who I'm playing without even realizing it. So for me, it was just going, oh, that's where that deep darkness is coming from is something I pulled without even realizing. So it's helpful for me to build, but I don't know as if I would necessarily tell you I'm Gene Hackman. I can see it going poorly too. Like, okay, my character looks just like Amber Heard and you're like, oh, I know how she's going to be. <laughs> she's going to shit everyone. Yeah. Well, her dog is stuck on, stuck on a bee or something. Yeah. So, you know. But like, even if you just say she just looks like Amber Heard, nothing personality wise, it doesn't matter. Like, that's going to be in there. Hmm. If there was a Questlandia 3.0, not a Questlandia 2, like a new edition of Questlandia Prime, is there anything that you want to see in it that wasn't in the first one? You know, keeping in mind that this is supposed to be like a short form fiction game. Like, is there anything that you'd be like, oh, I wish that game had, you know, an HP system or something like that? I don't know. I think example, rolling for mustaches would be... Mustache table. Right, you could have little Hitler mustaches, mm -hmm. you could have big Fu Manchus, you could have Hulk Hogan's, you could have... Sam Elliott's. You gotta have Sam Elliott's. That's if you roll a natural. 19 will get you a Salic, though. Like, I think maybe a setting table would be kind of fun, where it's like, okay, that's what your kingdom is about, but if you just, you know, at a, if, if you're stymied to figure out, okay, when is this going to be? What kind of narrative are we going to tell? Like, okay, this is Renaissance fantasy. This is caveman fantasy. This is far future, grimdark shit. So you, you want it to be more controlled. I want the option of that to be there. You want to let fate decide where you play. If you just don't have any solid feelings about it one way or the other, or it's uncomfortable. But, it, but by having rules that don't matter and you can pick and choose what you want, what's the point of having them to begin with? You can pick and choose to use that rule, but you're not on but the But where chart. do you draw the line? Why make rules that are so easily bypassed? Otherwise, why buy the book when you could just say, make up your own game? I know every game there's a list of optional rules. There's optional rules in the back of Questlandia now. Well, I don't know because I didn't read the book. <laughs> <laughs> I got told... We're playing Questlandia at seven. Be there Bring some dice. Because <laughs> it's tough to come up with something that I would add. Um, take away then. Or well, one thing that maybe you could add to Questlandia is give moves or something that the other characters can do for a certain character's scene, like a hard move, like oh, I will block you from doing this or something, and then roll a die to see what happens because as it is like when you're playing the game each scene there's essentially just one big roll at the end of it just to summarize it but if there were other roles leading up to that maybe that could change things about that role i don't know no i, I can it, see what you're getting it, at because a lot of the game is these very overarching influences such as like the country's going into war or everyone's poor or everyone's very sick blah 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 or you get uh the misfortunes or fortunes or you get a boost or whatever but that all is determined right at that role it'd be cool if there are roles leading up to it or it's just an idea <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if it's cool no no I mean. like more granularity to the rules and roles yeah or yeah we can put it that way. Whatever. You got any more questions? We're going to wrap this up. What do you want to do? You're the host. Yeah, I can fuck off, I guess. <laughs> well, you had a list of things. Did we get to them all? Yeah. 
Oh, no, you're right, final you're right. thoughts. You're right. Any final thoughts before we go, folks? <laughs> I'm glad that I got to try the game. I don't know that it's, I, I again, I don't know that I would play it with people I don't know. Uh, so I don't know how much use it would get outside of like my regular group. But like, I like the idea. It's very open ended. I'm interested to see what question Landia 2 has to add or take away from it to, to work as it's going to. Now, would a two replace one? No. Questlandia 2 is not... It's it's like Aliens does not replace Alien. Say no more. That's the best way I can describe yep. it to you. <laughs> CJ, final thoughts? I think role-playing games are all about, you know, power fantasies and jerking off your friends to get their power fantasy on. I think this game has a, a great potential for that. I hope they put that on the front of the box. <laughs> <laughs> Jerk off your friends with Questlandia. Hello, it's a power play fantasy... <laughs> Yes, uh, did he also say like, "Oh, it's great how like other you give other people some control and you, yeah. you know, CG's oh, I see, shit, yeah. <laughs> I see now." You <laughs> well, it's like tie CJ get, up, fuck him in the. You get your face. scene. It's like this is my scene, and that's what I want to do. And now it's time for you guys to jerk me off. Well, <laughs> <laughs> very different game. That would be <laughs> that, that, That's what I need to trust <laughs> people. <laughs> like this game, just some bros describing some cowboys and jerking each other off. I mean. I want to play this game. The last one has to eat the cowboy head. <laughs> We're not going to get any better than that. And for the of blunders, I've been Nate Magnuski. I've been here too. And may all your D's be jerked off with friends. And twelves. Twelve friends. What that? Twelve inch friends. Never that. <laughs> if you want to support the Pot of Blunders, please consider heading to our Patreon page. Patreon.com slash pot of blunders, all one word. We've got membership levels ranging from a dollar to ten dollars a month, which will get you access to things like our Discord, exclusive episodes of Jumping the Street Sharks, as well as a variety of other perks. You can also support the show and help us bring more attention to amazing indie authors by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate any help you can give. We love hearing from you. You can always find us on Twitter at Pot of Blunders, and you can also reach us via email at pot of blunders at gmail.com. Want more reviews, interviews, actual plays? Head to potofblunders.com and learn about even more amazing indie games. Thanks for listening. For the Pot of Blunders, I'm Nate Magnuski, and as always, may all your Ds be 12s.